Hey YouTube, this is City Prepping. If things go sideways in a really bad way, and I'm talking about the kind of bad that a region or country does it quickly or ever bounce back from, more than likely you and your family will die if you're not prepared. Are you prepared enough to ensure your family can weather a major catastrophe? You can show your support for this channel by liking, commenting, or sharing this video on social media. In addition, I'll provide links to products I discuss in the description below. Enjoy the video. I tend to try and be as optimistic as I can when I consider possibilities involving an SHTF scenario. I consider myself to be a practical, pragmatic prepper of sorts, and I tend to focus on the most probable disaster scenarios that I'll probably face in my area, like fires or earthquakes. I'd like to believe that most catastrophic problems in my region can be resolved within two to four weeks, assuming help comes. But I know as a prepper, it'd be foolish to not consider the possibility that things may not bounce back or help may never arrive. If this were to happen, would I be ready to take care of myself and my family? Many experts predict that if the power grid were to go down the United States, by the end of the first month, one half of all Americans would die. Can you live 30 days without power, water, or food being available to you? In this video, we'll discuss the 10 most common ways people will die in the first month if there were an extended catastrophe. While this topic could be perceived as discouraging, the good news is we'll present solutions to ensure you and your family will be prepared to face those challenges. So let's jump into this discussion. Number one, the lack of water or even safe water to drink. I put this intentionally first as you can only live three days without water. The biggest killer at the beginning of a catastrophe will be people dying from either a lack of water or the inability to gain access to sanitary water. If you've ever watched the news after a major catastrophe hits an area, you'll see that lethal diseases will quickly run rampant through individuals that have been displaced. The lack of sanitary water leads to diarrhea and other problems that can quickly kill people due to pathogens contaminating the water supply due to unsanitary conditions. How do you protect against this? Having gravity-fed water filtration or other water filtration systems that do not require power to operate will allow you to make your water safe. In my family's bug out bags, I have a few different water filters. A Sawyer water filter, a Live Straw, and a Pure Sip personal water filter. While these small filters are good for handling bacteria, they're not really equipped to handle contaminants in water. In our home, we have a Berkey water filter as well, which we use on a daily basis. These filters can make contaminated water safe to drink. If you do not have water stored, and a way to filter water, you need to focus on this first. In addition, have leech or pool shock to kill viruses if your filter doesn't filter at this level. Number two, starving to death. The average person can only last 21 days without food. Most Americans have only enough food for a few days as they're used to visiting the grocery store every few days. If a catastrophe prevents food deliveries to your local grocery store, which typically carries enough supplies for three days, then what? Malnutrition, food poisoning, and starvation will wipe out a large percentage of individuals in the first 30 days. This problem can be easily remedied by building a short-term food plan. In my home, I've stocked up on foods that we already use on a daily basis. We pull the food from this inventory as we need it. Things like spaghetti, rice, honey, beans, coffee, canned meats, canned food, etc. This is by no means a long-term food storage plan, which we'll cover in a future video, but rather this is food that is already used in our daily life. Here's what I did. We started setting aside a little extra money in our budget each month to grab additional food we already used and added it to our inventory. When we pull the food from our extra inventory supply, we have a clipboard in our storage area where we write down what was taken and on our next trip we simply replace that food. Remember, begin stocking staple foods that are easy to store and prepare and have a balance of fat, carbs, and proteins. Number three, your medication runs out. This is a bit of a challenge as you can't necessarily stock up on medications if your doctor only gives you enough of a supply until your next appointment. After a catastrophe hits an area, you can expect people will make a run on their local pharmacy to secure the drugs they need to survive. In addition, you need to consider the effect it will have in your local area when people come off their medication. Many people rely upon medication to not only deal with health issues, but also to keep them mentally stable. Without their meds, there could be severe side effects. People will get desperate and potentially dangerous. And without the medications, they won't last long. If your health condition can be managed with changes in your lifestyle, for example, getting in shape and losing weight, you need to give serious consideration to this, which leads us to our next point. Number four, people will die because they're out of shape. A few months ago, I had a tree in my backyard which began dying and it was time to cut it down. And I don't own a chainsaw, so I had to use an ax to cut it down. Growing up, we would cut trees down all the time on our property and split wood, but that was back when I was 18 years old. Now that I'm 40 years 
years old, that same task is much more difficult. Cutting down a tree was a bit of a challenge. While I typically spend about three days in the gym and I try to do cardio activities on other days, when cutting the tree down, I begin to realize I was no longer a spring chicken. I was winded quickly and I found myself wishing I had a chainsaw. I got sloppy as well due to getting tired and nearly injuring myself when I tried to cut on the tree at an angle and nearly caused the axe blade to bounce into my leg, which I'll talk about in the next point. But the fact that I've been keeping myself in decent shape made the job possible. In a grid down situation where things are not bouncing back, you'll probably be required to perform physical activities to survive. Please don't underestimate this point as something you can put on. You have the opportunity to get your body in shape. Also consider things like how much extra weight you are currently carrying on your body. Being obese can be a huge liability in a grid down situation. With a modification to your diet, getting off your behind and doing a little moving on a daily basis, you can steer yourself in the right direction. There may come a time when my family relies upon me to do physical labor in order to survive and I don't want to be unable to do it because I'd simply allowed my body to atrophy. Number five, individuals will die due to trauma, small injuries, or simply getting sick. As I mentioned earlier while chopping down the tree, I nearly had the ax blade slam into my leg. While it's easy to laugh this off as someone not being safe, think about how many people will get injured performing a lot of physical activities that carry the risk of injury. Not only will major trauma potentially injure individuals, but think about how many minor injuries can lead to a severe infection. If you've ever had a small cut that has turned into an infection that needed attention, you could simply visit your physician to get the proper medications to treat the problem. Now, imagine individuals getting small cuts and nicks that they neglected, only having it turn out to be something worse and no one can get help. Not only do injuries carry a large risk of death, but getting sick can as well. So what can you do? Begin gaining medical knowledge and the proper medical supplies now. At a minimum, have a book in your inventory like the Survival Medicine Handbook, which I'll also include in the description below. Number six, a lack of sanitation. In the previous point, I pointed out that individuals getting sick can result in death without medical attention. If things go bad in your area, proper sanitation will be critical. Have you considered how you will dispose of the waste your family produces? And by waste, I'm referring to your urine and excrement in addition to leftover food or dirty dishes or other rubbish. We're so used to simply flushing our toilets and taking the trash out to the curb and the problem's gone. But what happens when the sewage stops working and the trash man doesn't come to pick up your trash? Then what? A lack of sanitation can lead to illness which can spread to your home and kill your family. I would encourage you to begin researching options to dispose of your waste. Essential things like washing your hands thoroughly will be more important than ever. Have a decent supply of hand sanitizer. This will also be very helpful. Not only can getting sick be a problem in your family, but consider the damage it can do to morale having sick family members or being sick yourself. Number seven, many people envision the looters they'll have to face to be gangs or some type of people displaced coming to take their supplies. While marauders like this could be potentially a big threat, the reality is you may have neighbors or other family members which can turn on you if you've prepared and they have it. Now, when I first got serious about prepping, I thought sharing my excitement about prepping with friends and family would excite them to get serious about prepping as well. It pretty much had the opposite effect. They looked at me strangely and later they brought up that if things were to go bad, they'd come to my house immediately to seek help. Remember earlier we mentioned that only about 1% of Americans are quote unquote preppers. Well, what do you think the other 99% of Americans are gonna do when they can't find food or water? Thinking about this does concern me greatly because I never want to harm someone if they were hungry or coming for my stuff, especially if they were someone I knew and loved. And by coming for my stuff, I don't mean just asking or pleading. When people get desperate, they will do anything it takes to survive. If you only have enough supplies to keep your family alive, what will you do if that neighbor that has it prepared goes past demanding help and decides that they will take from you even if they have to hurt you or your family? So what are we to do here? If gangs or looters are bent on hurting you for what you have, then the answer is kind of obvious. But what are we to do regarding friends or family? This is a moral dilemma that goes in my head a lot, and I see it often discussed in the prepping community as well. If you want to open your supplies to help others, remember you are lessening the probability your family will live that much longer, and the probability those people will come back to keep asking for more and more help. In my mind, there's only three answers, which I'll discuss quickly. And please, by all means, if you have another view on this or better ideas, please share in the comments section below. Number one, keep your mouth shut. The less information you provide to others about what you have, the better. Number two, help others now and educate them. While this may seem to be the exact opposite piece of advice I just gave you in point one, you don't have to disclose all your preps and show off everything you have to them. Just help educate them that they should prepare. Remember, the less desperate they are, the less of a threat they are to you and the more they can help you. Number three, arm yourself. If it comes down to it, you may be forced to protect your family. While I have no desire to harm anyone, if it comes down to me and my family and a person bent on hurting us, I'll do whatever it takes. And on a side note, I don't advocate violence on this channel, 
and I greatly value human life. Remember, if you harm or kill someone, you will ultimately be held accountable for your actions. But when the social niceties that we enjoy in our society go out the window when people get desperate and they pose a threat to me or my family, I won't hesitate for a moment to do whatever it takes to stop them. Number eight, you aren't prepared for reality. So your plan is if things hit the fan, you're gonna grab that awesome bug out bag and you're gonna run to the mountains and live off the land. In your mind, you dream of picking berries, drinking from streams, trapping rabbits, or hunting deer. You'll live in a tent with your family and survive in that national forest near you. Okay, so I don't have time in this video to break this entire fantasy down but good luck with that. The reality is that all that cool gear that you bought, the 500 rounds of ammo you're storing up, the seeds you purchase online to build a big crop that you never even planted, those things aren't gonna save you. If you've got a family, think you can just run into the mountains and live off the land indefinitely? If you're not practicing this lifestyle now, you're probably not gonna suddenly transition overnight to this and suddenly thrive or even survive. So what am I saying here? Live in reality on this issue. The fantasy of becoming some amazing survivalist with several family members in tow isn't gonna last very long. I live in a suburban environment, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my suburban home will not support my family long-term. I know we can definitely survive for at least 30 days, maybe even 60, if we're able to bug in and don't have any major conflicts, as I mentioned in the previous point. So what can you do? My biggest piece of advice at this point is network. Build relationships with other like-minded preppers and people that are preparing like you. I've been fortunate to find a solid network in my area. In the past, I've used the website meetup.com to find a local prepper group in my area. You'll definitely meet some oddballs, but overall I've been able to meet some really solid people. While it's beyond the scope of this video, the lone wolf mentality will only get you so far. Live in reality and take an honest assessment of what you and your family can do and do yourself a favor and connect with other preppers that can help you where you are deficient. Number nine, you'll freeze to death. I'm fortunate to live in the part of the United States that doesn't get terribly cold during the winter, but in many parts of the United States, temperatures can drop to very dangerous levels that can kill. So what will you do? Are you gonna start that fireplace that you've never used before? Okay, do you have firewood already cut and prepared? If not, do you have the tools to do so? And do you have places around you to go and cut down firewood? For many that cannot get a fuel source in time before the temperature drops to dangerous levels, they'll try burning things that they shouldn't and they'll stand the possibility of carbon monoxide poisoning or possibly burning down their own home. If you have a fireplace, start by making sure the chimney is cleaned out and have firewood on hand that is already cut up. Find methods that others use in your area to heat their home that is not dependent on the electrical grid functioning. Each region is unique and different in how they handle heating homes and be sure to have a backup plan should the power go off. And number 10, you give up. Last but not least, many people will simply give up. Some will simply lose the will to move forward or to keep fighting. Things may not go according to plans, bad things may happen, your supplies may get looted, someone in your home may die. The list of what could happen can go on and on. The key is this, do not give up, especially if you have a family or others depending on you. You may have to dig deep inside to find the strength and fortitude that come hell or high water, you will not back down or give up. If you have dependence, giving up is not an option. Remember this, a negative, defeated attitude can be like cancer and spread to others around you. As we discussed earlier, morale in times like this is critical. This goes beyond just having the right tools or supplies. If you are prepping now for yourself and your family, remember that they will be looking to you to not only lead in your preps, but in those dark moments when all hope seems lost. Don't give up. Determine now that you will dig in your hills and align your mind to that end. You may be the only beacon of hope others have. While making this video, it challenged me to reconsider a few things I need to focus on a little more, and I hope it will do the same for you. Again, please feel free to provide your feedback in the comments section below. As always, be safe out there.